The story about the whole Domino Sugar company that owned them lawsuit really was tragic uh, at the time. It had to be frightening because you lost the initial lawsuit and actually had to change the name. What, what did you change the name to? A Pizza Dispatch. And, and if I had lost that lawsuit, I'd have been out of business because all the all these franchisees were paying uh, royalties for the use of the name and then I didn't own the name. So. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Million Dollar Monday. I'm your host, Greg Mazzello, bringing you real successful people with real useful advice for people with big dreams. I understand big dreams. I turned an investment of $200 and a lot of great advice from some really successful people into my big dream, Proforma, that today is a half billion dollar company. Well, hello, listeners. I am truly honored and even humbled by my guest for today, uh, a man whose childhood would suggest he had no right to ever be successful, facing such challenges, losing his father at the age of four, living in more foster homes than he probably can count, spending many years in an orphanage, and just struggling his way through his childhood and his youth. And yet somehow he achieved great success uh, in starting a business, growing it to thousands of stores, selling that business for a billion dollars, and then, and then moving from success to significance and starting a university and a law school that's near and dear to his faith and creating another wonderful success story there. So I am really looking forward to our guest today telling us his great story. Welcome and thank you for joining me, Tom Monahan, founder of Domino's and founder of Ave Maria University. Tom, thank you. Thank you. Well, let's start at the beginning. Um, it's very touching how you were very drawn to your father, but tell us this and, and, and it was very sad how you lost him at such a young age. But tell us about that. Tell us about your, those early years and, and uh, uh, some of the challenges of those early years. Uh, we were poor. Uh, my father um, uh, had a lot of health problems. I wasn't aware of them, and of course, until he died. And, uh, he had ulcers, and they didn't have penicillin back then. And he died at the age of 29 on Christmas Eve. Uh, and I was four, I was almost five, uh, uh, and I remember him very well. I could uh, write a small book about memories I have with my dad. He, he's very dear to me, and uh, um, uh, I'm sure he's in heaven. By the way, Tom mentions a book, and I think for anybody that really wants to read an unbelievable story about truly an unbelievable man, uh, Monaghan, A Life is a is just truly awe-inspiring. All right, so move us on into uh, your, I know your mother placed you into different foster care situations. Can you even recall how many foster care families you lived with over those early years? Uh, there were probably about uh, eight or 10 of them. Uh, uh, a couple of them were just a week or two uh, when my dad first died. But uh, uh, after that, there were maybe a, a year to, a year and a half. But a lot of them were uh, uh, farms. And uh, because I asked the welfare people that put me on farms because I enjoyed farming. I liked working, uh, milking the cows and, and all that. And, uh, and uh, invariably, the people I lived with uh, uh, treated me like a member of the family. I was, I, was a, I was a good kid. I didn't get in trouble. I liked to work. And, and, uh, uh, and they as long as they gave me enough to eat, and they <laughs> usually did. Yeah. I know you had uh, um, in and out of foster homes and other living situations, and then in and out of college, and it seemed like that never quite worked for you, uh, being able to have the money uh, and to be able to afford to go to college. Um, so get us caught up on that trip to Chicago. I was walking by the post office, and uh, 
in Harvey, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago, and uh, saw a recruiting sign for joining the military. And I had uh, seen ads where if you join the army, they'll pay for your college education. So I thought I'd go and check it out. And uh, there was a recruiter there, and he told me that's true. If you join for three years, you get two years of college, all paid for. I said, would that be good at Michigan? He said, yeah, no problem. So I signed up. Uh, and uh, he never uh, uh, mentioned that he was a Marine. He always, he never corrected me when I said Army. So I went down to the, the Federal Building in Detroit, went through the, uh, all the uh, physicals and, uh, and all the other stuff. And, they, uh, and it was time to sign in and I saw a globe and anchor down at the bottom of the thing. I thought there was all branches there, but it was just a big day for Marines because everybody I ran into was Marines. So, uh, and I, so I asked the guy next to me, is this the Marines or is, is this, the, is this the, the Army? He says, it's the Marine Corps, you dummy. So I figured, what's the difference? And, and I, so I signed it and I found out <laughs> there's a big difference. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. And um, <clears throat> kind, kind of interesting that you had a fellow Marine that ended up being, uh, although not for a good reason, ended up becoming famous, huh? <laughs> yeah, Lee Harvey also. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know he was a Marine. Oh, goodness. That's kind of crazy. All right. So you served your time in the Marines. Um, and I, I, I like the story about how you were in the Marines and, and uh, um, uh, um, you started daydreaming. I think it was maybe it was because you were on a boat uh, being transported to and from Japan. Yes, we were out in the middle of the Pacific. And um, actually, uh, since I wrote the book, someone reminded me that that wasn't uh, the timing. The timing is when we were on uh, maneuvers in the Philippines. We were out in the middle of the South Pacific uh, with nothing to do for a while. And, and so I was laying in my bunk dreaming about all the things I was going to do and be when I got out of the Marines. And, and that was pretty elaborate because I, I did a lot of this, particularly on the farm, just to entertain myself and, and, uh, and keep busy. And all of a sudden, I realized, so what if I accomplish all this and I do all this? What good's it going to do me? Does it really mean anything? So then I really said, well, what is important? And that's where I came up with uh, my five priorities for life. And it's been a roadmap for my life, and, and it still is today. Yeah. Tell us what those five priorities are. I, I love them, Tom. I, I think that we uh, sh- they're something we should all live by. The first one is uh, spiritual. Uh, second is uh, social. Third is uh, mental. The fourth is physical, and the fifth is financial. And but they have to be in that order. And uh, uh, and uh, I was more inclined to the bottom one, but I realized that doesn't do me any good. I was more inclined to the bottom one, but I realized that doesn't do me any good if I don't succeed in the in the in the higher priorities. And so that's as soon as I discovered that idea, it, it became a roadmap for my life. And I said I want to be a get an A in all five of those categories right. so that's, I hope yeah. to do I'm still working on the top top one that's the hard one <laughs> we're, we're still we're still a work in progress all of us and uh, uh, I don't think it's about getting to the destination I think it's about the wonderful journey uh, which you're certainly living all right now as I follow the story this when you got home uh, is when your brother approached you with the idea of getting into the pizza business after about a year, year and a half, I was okay. I went to uh, University of Michigan uh, uh, for three weeks. Ran out of money. I didn't have any textbooks, and then uh, so worked about two or three jobs trying to get some money together for the next semester. Went back the next semester, and I was so tired of working so much I couldn't, so I, I couldn't stay awake in class. So I said I'd drop out and again, and, and maybe uh, the following year I, you know, and then that's when my brother approached me about. Uh, this pizza place that was for sale, and it was um, it was um, uh, five hundred dollars down. It been closed for some time. Never stayed open more than a month, month or so. And uh, the idea was I'd work half the night, and he'd work half the night. It was only open at night. And had plenty of time to study and, and enough money to go to school. And so we we did that. We uh, borrowed nine hundred from a credit union and gave the owner 500 and bought some food and opened up. But this, after we signed the papers, my brother got cold feet, didn't want to give security of his 
post office job as a mailman. So I was stuck with that alone. I'd given up all my uh, uh, things I was doing. And so there goes college. And after and I was working seven nights a week and losing money, and bills were piling up. And I told my brother, I, I got to have a day off. You own half of this. So I he, he took, took a day off, uh, came back in the next day. He came into the store and he said, I, I don't want anything to do with this. Uh, why don't you just take it over? And, uh, you don't have to pay me anything. I said, well, <laughs> truly, it's not worth anything, but I feel that you did take a risk. I should give you something. Uh, uh, then I, we had a Volkswagen, a used Volkswagen. I think we paid 50 or $100 down on it. And uh, I said, you, uh, you take the Volkswagen, I'll keep making the payments. And that's how I bought out 50% of what became the largest pizza chain in the world. <laughs> Not a bad trade, a Volkswagen for half a Domino's. <laughs> uh, at the time, he had a better deal. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sure that's true. I'm sure that's true because the story didn't start out with you or making a lot of money. And if I remember correctly, you got like you had no clue how to make pizzas and you got 15 minutes worth of training from the yeah. former owner and you had to figure it out from there. Yeah. All right. So, so now you're, I think the original name was Dominex. Uh, 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 and and um, when when did the idea for franchising come come into the uh, operation? Well, the first store uh, became the uh, and, and within a, a year or two the busiest pizzeria in the state of Michigan, and um, and uh, Dominic uh, owned the store in Ann Arbor in the same county, and he called me up one day and said, "You can't use my name anymore." He had the name registered at the courthouse. So I had to scurry around and find a new name. And so we talked to the employees about different names. And, and one of the drivers came back from his delivery. He said, I got a new name, Domino's. We wanted to be Italian and we wanted to be something that's not common in pizza. And uh, so where'd you get that? He says, well, the, the little pizza shoe store. And the, and the, and the salesman who ordered the pizza and said, uh, hey, there's a guy from Domino's. <laughs> Is that how it came about? Yeah. Wow. And so we had, we had, I had two other little stores I started, and, um, and we had three stores. So I said, we'll change the uh, name to Domino's on the stores, and we'll, and we'll put three dots on the Domino for our logo. And, uh, and by the way, I was the first one that ever used car top signs in the pizza delivery business. We had uh, uh, big red Domino's on top of our delivery cars. When did you start selling franchises, though? After about... Uh, uh, let me see, uh, about 65 or 6, I started in 60, uh, and that's when we started. We, I took one of my uh, smaller stores and sold it to uh, someone that financed it with no money down. They paid me 2% of the sales, and, and that's how I got in the franchising business. Yeah, uh, pretty typical, right? Pretty typical, Give kind of give the first few away, and then... How many stores did you have when the people that own Domino Sugar uh, entered the scene? Uh, about uh, two seventy-five or so, two two fifty. Uh, I wasn't making any money, and there's a lot of the stores that uh, weren't able to pay royalties. But I, I was, uh, I was growing, and I was working my way out of a real big debt that I got myself into. Uh, uh, but that lawsuit took five years, and we finally won it in 1980. And that's when I took off. We had about 300 stores then. And uh, we were the fastest growing restaurant chain in history. We were, yeah. In one year, we opened 954 stores, the most ever opened by any chain in history up to that time. Yeah. And all focused all on the uh, pizza delivery. Yeah. The, the story about the whole Domino Sugar company that owned them lawsuit really was tragic uh, at the time. It had to be frightening because you lost the initial lawsuit and actually had to change the name. What, what did you change the name to? A pizza Dispatch. Pizza and, uh, Dispatch? Yes, yeah, so we opened during the uh, appeal period, we opened some stores under that name because the judge wouldn't let us open any more under the name Downhouse, yeah. so, uh, which we were surprised at that. And so uh, we, when we won the appeal, and uh, we were able to revert back to revert them all to Domino's. And that was uh, really, 
And if I had lost that lawsuit, I'd have been out of business because all the all these franchisees were paying uh, royalties for the use of the name, and then I didn't own the name. So <laughs> that, that was, uh, I was living under that cloud for five years is very tough. Yeah. So many hurdles that you've had to overcome, including, I think that your original store and first offices burned down. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that just about put me out of business. Yeah. And then I overexpanded uh, after I got going again. And uh, that just about put me out of business. I did lose control of the, of the company. And, uh, and the people that came in, uh, milked it and, and uh, basically ruined it. And they handed it back to me uh, with a lot more debt and, so I had to work two or three years to get out from under that debt. And then the download sugar thing came along. And then, I, and then that was five years. And then finally, all those problems were behind me. Uh, I, I took off like a rocket. Just so many hurdles. I, I, I can't help but think that maybe God prepared you for the tough life of growing dominoes with all of the ups and then the downs and, and the hurdles through the tough life that you had as a child. I mean, it, it probably more than prepared you for some of those tough things. So, but during the course of those five years, you bought the Tigers, won a World Series, and five years later, uh, I think it was about 1985, you were over two and a half thousand stores. That's about right, yeah. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, we got up to, uh, by uh, the lawsuit was over in 80, by about 88 or 89, we had 5,000 stores. Right, right, right. So at some point, talk, talk to me about coming to the decision to want to sell your business, to sell your baby. Well, uh, yeah, you're leaving out to the last and the biggest uh, comeback. <laughs> because uh, after things really got successful, I got uh, caught up in the success and uh, uh, a lot of toys. And I got into a lot of other businesses. And, uh, and the next thing you know, I'm, I'm in trouble again. Uh, and uh, Pizza Hut passed us up as uh, we had 54% of all the pizzas delivered in the United States and they passed us up just in a few years. And so I had to go back and bail out the company. We were half a billion in debt and uh, stores were uh, losing money, closing up. And so, uh, and the banks are all over me. And so I had to come back in and uh, turn the company around again. And I don't think I ever worked harder. And that was about 91, 92. And, uh, and about 94, I completely turned the company around, better shape than ever. But uh, uh, they say it was the biggest comeback in the history of the, of the Russian industry. Yeah. And then from then on, I, uh, and, and along the line, before I got in trouble, I read a book by C.S. Lewis called Mere Christianity. And there was a chapter in there on pride. And uh, and I and, I, and that, uh, I couldn't sleep. But I, I realized how what a big ego I had, and how everything I was doing was to impress people, uh, and uh, and I didn't like that. And I, that's not what I wanted to be. I was sort of a closet show off, and so I, I gave up all the luxuries and all the toys, got rid of it all, uh, and I took what I call a millionaire's vow of poverty. And it's a good thing I did because later on I. Uh, got in a lot of trouble. So when I came out of it this time around, I got that out of my system. And so everything I was going to do with my success was going to be for the church. And uh, in the last three years uh, before I sold the company, we were, by most people's uh, estimate, the best run national wrestling chain in the country. And that is we uh, had the highest same store sales increase per store of any national wrestling chain in the country. And then, and then I sold out and, uh, because I was uh, 61 years old. I wanted to do this university. Uh, I was going to take all my time. I figured I had 10 good years left. And uh, that was how I yeah. the university came. So, so tell us about uh, your university, Ave Maria University and the law school. I couldn't get to zoning. We started out in Michigan. I, I bought a, uh, uh, a closed up uh, uh elementary school at auction. I used that to start. So I was going to build this uh, uh, beautiful university uh, uh, in Ann Arbor where I had the land that was a couple thousand acres around 
Domino's Farms, where Domino's headquarters is. And I, but I couldn't get zoning. And meanwhile, I'm operating in, in uh, Ypsilanti and this one person at the seams. So I prayed hard, and what am I going to do? So I decided, well, maybe I, maybe, maybe Ann Arbor isn't the best place. Uh, just because it's convenient for me, where's the best place in the country to open a new Catholic university? And I figured that it would, it would be uh, Southwest Florida, Naples, uh, the wealthiest area in the country uh, per capita, uh, uh, great weather, uh, very few Catholic schools in the South, uh, yet uh, 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 the population was moving that way. Uh, and I thought it'd be the easiest place to attract good faculty and students too. So. I, uh, I, I moved it moved it to Naples. Well, congratulations. Uh, I know from reading the book that uh, um, sticking and being uh, true to your faith sometimes just cost you dearly. Uh, cost you dearly with people complaining that uh, some of your positions uh, uh, were hurting your franchising business and and. Uh, um, and yet you've stayed true to your faith and you stayed true to your beliefs. And so you're to be uh, respected for that now. So you've successfully built a large, one of the largest, most successful franchising pizza chains ever. You then sell that for a billion dollars. You build a very successful Catholic university and law school. What big dreams do you have now for this season of your life? Well, I think the uh, university has... Uh... Yeah, you know, we've had to deal with a lot of problems with the housing uh, uh, crisis and everything uh, that we haven't been able to really get going. And now uh, the town is booming and uh, we got a brand new president who's outstanding, uh, fully in line with my vision. And, uh, and I, I think we're really ready to launch that, that rocket. Tom, your story is admirable. I am truly humbled and honored that you would join me today and share your story. And I really appreciate your time respect you more than you know. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Enjoyed it very much.